to have our wonderful panelists uh, here with us uh, today. We're extremely delighted to have the film director, anna Katrin Händel, here. Um, anna Katrin Händel was born in East Berlin, where she studied design and then worked as a freelance costume and set designer. Uh, she has been described as a documentarist of East Germany. She made her film debut in 1999 and then founded her own film production company, It Works Media. You may have noticed uh, the logo on the uh, film uh, today as well. Um, and she is the managing director of, of that company uh, and has produced and directed feature and documentary films, uh, quite a few of which have an East German theme um, and deal with exceptional artists, um, current affairs and social issues. Uh, some of her films, her previous films, which are also important in our context today, um, are um, uh, portraits of uh, two other East German writers, um, Paul Gratzig and Sascha Andersen, respectively, who um, were later found out to have been informants for the East German secret police, the Stasi. Uh, and together with these two films, her film Familie Brasch forms a trilogy. Um, which I think you've called a treason uh, trilogy, uh, anna Katrin, and I'll be very interested to uh, ask you uh, some more about that. Um, we're also uh, delighted to, uh, to have Katie Trumpner with us on the panel today. Um, Katie Trumpner is Emily Sanford, Sanford Professor of Comparative Literature, English, and Film and Media Studies at Yale University. Uh, Katie has published widely on German film and literature and has also worked on Thomas Brasch uh, quite early on. And she is currently finishing two books, um, one on Nazi cinema and the other on German cinema during the Cold War, uh, both in some ways related to our panel uh, today as well. Uh, and Juliette Bungs is a political educator and writer who earned her PhD at the University of Minnesota in 2013. And after that, between 2014 and 2000, um, recently actually, she worked for NGOs in Berlin and Hamburg to confront anti-Semitism as well as right-wing and religious radicalization. Her mother was André Therese Loising, born Leda, who survived the Shoah in France and Switzerland and as the name Leda might, might signal uh, to some of you already, uh, Juliette is one of the granddaughters of the major East German writer, Jewish writer and poet, uh, Stefan Hamlin, um, and she lives in Berlin. So thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Um, and again, if you have questions, um, and we do hope you have questions and, and uh, comments uh, on the film and for our panelists, uh, then please, uh, open the Q&A window and type these into the Q&A box and send them and you can do this from now. So the question of betrayal is as old as humanity is. It doesn't have anything to do with East Germany or the D GDR, but I come from there and I'm trying to make films about things, you know, worlds that people lived in, political processes, but particularly about people whom I know and I'm familiar with where I know my way around. And I'm not looking for my stories based on ideas. It's also based on people. And it's the case that I've seen lots of films that also dealt with the Stasi or betrayal that talk about this time in the GDR, East Germany, but I really wasn't that into these subjects. But then I knew people who dealt with the issue of betrayal, but their stories were very different stories. And that's why I decided to choose their perspective. But it's just basically to get a different view of the subject and the connection of East Germany, the GDR, the Stasi, but to put it in a different context, because I think that these contexts are not things we can separate, that these connections are much more interlinked than just to do with the GDR. And the GDR wasn't founded because somebody felt like doing it. It's the result of the Second World War. Could you explain that in a little bit more detail, what you mean with betrayal? 
Is there a particular dimension of betrayal in East Germany or in socialism, communism, in the GDR that you were referring to? Well, you know, not really. I mean, or maybe I should put it another way. I guess I never really thought about it as to whether it was something special about GDR. That's all I know. But the way people have written about it, talked about it, filmed it, that's not how it is. You know, if I ask someone today in Germany, what do you think, how many of the population in East Germany were informal, were informants? How many do you think, what percentage of the GDR population were informal informants? 20 to 30 percent, Kathy says. Exactly. This percentage comes about, that's the sense that you have if you see the films, you read the books, then that's what you sense. You think 20 to 30 percent were informing on other people. So one in four, one in five were informal informants of the Stasi. And, and that's not true. So that's what's so interesting for me, you know, this sort of total shift in the de depiction of history. But I'm not trying to academically argue against it. I'm not an academic. I'm just trying to tell stories on the subject that shed different light on, on these experiences. And I'm not trying to sort of enlighten the population who watch my film. That's not my job. I'm just trying to allow new thoughts to emerge and that people ask themselves questions, apart from the fact that betrayal didn't stop after the end of East Germany. Now, that's certainly true, says Kathy. And then this whole question of Brash, the case of the Brash family is very different than the two previous films that you made. How did you end up wanting to do a film about the Brash family? Well, lots of different things led to that. It isn't just one thing that led to that. It started with the fact that I started to do films because I was so annoyed at the films that were out there about social processes in more recent German history. And then I asked my mother at some point, what kind of film would you like to see? And the Mann's film by Heinrich Brilleur was just had just come out and I said, well, what film should, you know, I said, what film should I make? And she said, well, the, the Manns, you know, about Thomas Mann and his family. There's a biopic, you know, sort of fictional story mixture of sort of documentary and fiction. I mean, I don't really like that, merging fiction and documentary in that sh sort of shape. But the Manns are from a world that I no longer know. But what kind of family could I look at if I wanted to shoot a film about that from the world that I know? And really very quickly, I mean, you've got the Metzics, the founder of DEFA. That's an amazing family, and I know them. I know the family members. And I knew the Brash family. I knew Marianne Brash, the only surviving daughter of the family. I met her really early on. I knew Peter Brash and I knew Thomas Brash. And Maria Brash wrote this novel at some point about her family. And it was 2011. And as soon as she wrote it, I found out about it and I asked if I could read it really early on. And what touched me in her novel was that she wrote it in such a sort of lighthearted way. Of course, very much her own subjective view of things but I thought it was great. I thought it was really interesting. And that's when I thought to make a, I would make a film about it. But there's so many other reasons behind it as well. But I would just talk at length here about it. We don't want that. Well, we do in a way. We're trying to talk about your film, says Kathy. <coughs> and we do want to talk about it. Yeah, well, thanks. And I mean, and in East Germany, or the GDR, there weren't real stars the way there are stars in today's day and age you know it girls like total stars but Nina Hagen was a star and Katharina Talbach and Thomas Brasch they were they were stars and when they went to the west to west germany in 19 was it 76 78 but i know i said it in the film and got it right Anyway, it was the late 70s. I was basically a kid, but I knew there were stars even then. 
And I was interested in that as well. You know, this sort of gap between, you know, the functionary families and then these real sort of pop star types. They really were. They were like pop stars. And I thought that was great because Sibylla Bergman had a great photographer who took photos and I thought the photos were great. You know, it's pretty simple, these things that I sort of saw as a child, as a young person, and they inspired me. And then later I met these people in flesh and blood, in real. And then I started wanting to know more about what was really going on and it took a long time. And of course I did a lot of research. And of course I spent many, 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 many hours and years engaging with these issues. But what sparked it all was a very personal thing, like with all of my films. Thank you. Thank you. You've, you've worked on, on Thomas Flash, and I'm wondering whether you've, you found the Thomas Flash you encountered in your work in anne Catherine's film. What were your thoughts uh, when you saw the film? So uh, I was going to say, um, I'm hoping that this film and also the Andreas Kleiner biopic about Brush, which I haven't seen yet and which I hear is... Um, largely about sex or, or very significantly about sex. Um, it's just opened in New York. Um, I'm hoping that this is going to mean that Thomas Brosch will finally, um, that his, some of his literary texts will be translated into English. He's very poorly served in English right now. There's sort of one short story from his first short story collection available. And his films, um, as people talk about in the film. In Germany, he's seen as a kind of outsider and he's not well known um, here either, but I hope um, that will change. Um, my own relationship to Brosh is kind of complicated. I first encountered him um, in graduate school and I must say um, before the uh, fathers die, the sons, um, and I didn't really like it. I was irritated by it. I thought it was kind of a hipster text and really broish, and its gender politics were terrible. Um, but he is one of those authors and filmmakers, sort of like Heiner Müller. At first glance, you will say, "Ugh, oh, this is sort of awful. I don't really like this," but it sort of sticks with you and. I find myself going back to those stories again and again and again and again and teaching some of them. And I feel the same way about his films. They kind of get your hooks in you. And I think that he addresses all kinds of uh, ethical and historical topics which aren't otherwise well addressed. So for instance, um, I don't know, Kathy, this is probably going far beyond what you wanted, but for instance, in his film, The Passenger, he is, in, to my mind, now that I'm working on Nazi cinema, I see that the film, among other things, highlights an aspect of Third Reich cinema which has not been much talked about or it's talked about in a kind of scattered way. It was absolutely ruthless with filmic subjects, documentary subjects, uh, quite repeatedly, some of the major directors like um, Veit Harlan and like um, Lenny Riefenstahl went to ghettos to recruit extras and they used people in captivity for their films. And there is on that level, a kind of horrific use of prisoner labor um, in key Nazi films. And I think this also applies to Nazi documentary films about um, filmed in mental hospitals about patients who should be euthanized. And basically they are using the images and the movement and the faces of people against their will. They're using captive subjects um, in order to argue for their elimination. And that's what um, both, especially Veit Harlan and Jude Zeus, but also Riefenstahl to a degree in Tiefland. She took gypsies from the concentration camp in order to depict the lightness and frivolity of gypsy life. That is ethically so nowhere. And I think that Brasha's film is fundamentally addresses this subject, which should have been one of the main things that everybody thinks about Third Reich cinema, but it historically hasn't been. So I think that it 
uh, it's a film that does many, many different kinds of things at once, but that's one of the fundamental things it addresses itself to. So to my mind, it's a really indispensable film. And yet when I first saw it, when it first came out, I didn't really like it much, but it has stuck with me and it's got its claws into me. So I don't know, Kathy, if that's what you would hope for, but. <clears throat> no, I think it's really interesting what you say, because um, I remember watching the film in the cinema back back then when it first played uh, in, the, in West 80s. Berlin in the 1980s. Yeah. Yes. And uh, and then again, when I sat in a, in a seminar in grad school, um, uh, one of my uh, professors, David Batrick, um, was a kind of a, a bit of a legend. Uh, he he showed it. I was really surprised that he that he even knew it uh, because at the time it didn't seem like a big film. But but and yet, like you say, it absolutely stuck with me. And in hindsight, I think you know I keep sort of thinking about it and returning to it and rewatching it. I think it's one of the greatest films of that time that somehow deals with as you say, so many different topics, but uh, I, I mean, the, the legacy of, of the Nazi era of, of, of film, uh, the whole denial, I mean, it's very astute in picking up a topic that was the subject of a documentary film at the time, which Leni Riefenstahl then succeeded in getting banned yes. and which we still can't see, even though Riefenstahl is no longer alive, that documentary film about these extras uh, which Riefenstahl specifically took from concentration camps is, is still a forbidden film. Um, so, I mean, he really, in, in some ways, uncannily had his, you know, had his, uh, you know, finger his, on the pulse, his yeah. finger on the, you know, on finger on puts dead, dead side. And in some ways that's true with so many of the things he, he wrote that at the time, maybe they were almost a little bit obscure, uh, but in hindsight, when you get, when you return to them, also his poetry, um, uh, there's just something in it that that yeah that kind of stays with you. If I um, could just if I could just read um, five lines of Brosh from his um, film script for Domino. This is a this is a kind of throwaway comment that I just think finds so devastating and it's so epigrammatic. In immigration, I still thought what was started in the 20s and was now forbidden by the Nazis will continue after them. But that was wrong. It was strangled like a child in the cradle. And afterwards, there was nothing more. That is really devastating. How, how important, um, Anna-Katrin and Katie, would you say is the, the Jewish element in the, the, the maybe the Brasch family more, more broadly and in Thomas's life and work more specifically? Uh, Anna-Katrin Hendel, was, was that a dimension that was that kind of stood out for you when you made the film, the Jewish dimension? Because in watching again, I, I, I noticed it much more than I did the first time around. The first time I didn't notice it very much uh, at all, but then when I saw it again, um, it, it's kind of seemed to, in a way, infor inform so many different things, including the soundtrack. Um. The Jewish dimension certainly is neglected in the film, but it has to do with the fact that I was trying to make a film about the family. And naturally, the origin of the family plays an incredibly important role, and the film does take us through that a little bit as well. But I'm sure Juliette could actually say a great deal more about that if she wanted to life in East Germany really had a kind of squashing of Jewish culture there. I don't understand it, or you might think you don't understand it, but it just didn't seem to even be there. And the functionary's father, Horst, wasn't that interested in it. Thomas, as far as I understand, he himself, but particularly Kati, and Ursula Andermatt as well, and Marian, it increasingly did play in a more important role. But since it isn't a film just about Thomas, and you had to be very careful in tackling this issue, the Jewish dimension, I mean, there was a Jewish dimension in the film, 
but it wasn't a sort of all comprehensive one. Really, I'd need to make a separate film just about that. But I was trying to make a film about the whole family where it, it plays a role, but I wouldn't say that that dimension was that important. But I do think it was very important. But there's there's something really big, something precious that you can't just sort of sweep under the carpet in the film or just sort of squeeze it in there somehow. But the lack of understanding, the ignorance was what was there in life. And if you do a film about Thomas, just about Thomas, then it would play a really big role. Things to that. On the one hand, um, Frosch made The Passenger uh, together with Yorick Becker, who is another a uh, really important GDR writer who wrote uh, Jacob the Liar and who also um, increasingly, who was himself a ghetto survivor, uh, a child survivor who was separated from his parents and so on, and who, who lost family members and who experienced um, extremely uh, difficult ghetto circumstances as a child. So, and, and whose writing became also increasingly preoccupied with the Holocaust and with the question of Jews in the GDR and so on. So on the one hand, there's this really important um, artistic collaboration with one of the pioneers whose life story is so inextricably bound up with the Holocaust. Um, one other really important thing, there would be a way, and I realize this is not quite the take that the film has on it, but there would be a way of seeing the Kindertransport as the beginning of the sort of psychic difficulties of the family. Um, because if you take seriously um, what it was like for uh, the parents as children or as young teenagers to be separated from their parents and to not be able to go back, no matter how many pleading letters they might write to their parents, nobody was gonna respond. Um, and also to know that their families were in mortal danger. And then um, I don't know all the details, but I know that Horsebrush did spend time in detention in Canada. And I, one of my former professors was um, a Viennese uh, adolescent of 16 who got to London with his father, then was in the Isle of Man and was also sent to Canada and kept a diary. So that's very well documented. And those were also terrible conditions. They put the Jewish, they put, uh, Jewish foreign nationals indiscriminately in these camps in Canada with Nazis. So basically it was a prison experience. It was a concentration camp experience of a kind. And then presumably part or all of the families died having been left behind. So the whole question of child abandonment or the adequacy of these people to parent um, seems to me to probably have a pretty deep root in these childhood experiences. And there's that very striking moment in your film um, where we hear Marianne talking about being sent away to the, to the um, Wochenkrippe, where she's sent away on Monday and she's brought back, and she's clearly a very small child when this happens. So on the one hand, yes, we have to build socialism. It's like it's like a parable out of uh, Gladkov cement. Oh, yes, we have to just put our child over there while we build socialism. Oh, too bad the child has died. Um, there was collateral damage to the family and to the children because of this mission people had. But on the other hand, it's also clearly a kind of reenactment of their own childhood where they were sent away and not allowed to come back no matter what happened. So there's a way in which the Holocaust is there as a daily presence in the very dynamics of family life on some pretty deep level, which is horrifying and fascinating and exemplary. I think this is a moment to maybe bring in Juliette into the, into the conversation. Um, uh, Juliette, I wanted to ask you uh, this question, in fact, about uh, the particular predicament maybe of artists and intellectuals in the GDR, maybe both in terms of your own family experience, but also uh, your, your, your work. And I mean, are there parallels between your family history and, and the Brass and how does, uh, do these things that, that Katie just, just said about the kind of the history of the, of the Holocaust and abandonment, you know, how, how do you see these maybe playing out both in the, in the Brash case, but also maybe in your own family? 
Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so many interesting um, points here that uh, you all brought up. <clears throat> um, so uh, where to start? Um, of course, to answer your question, of course, there are many parallels. Um, and, you know, I used to call them like uh, the East German Jewish dynasties. <laughs> so um, there are other families, um, the Brashs, uh, my family, the Kahanas. There are many families that are the Rappaports, really interesting families with really interesting stories. I was lucky enough to um, get a chance once to make an interview with the uh, Mitya and Inge Rappaport when they were still both alive, uh, which was fascinating. Um, so, um, and coming from a very strong background of psychoanalytic psychological research, because you know I was a member of the uh, psychoanalytic um, association in the US, and I had a mentor, and I worked with her in specifically um, uh, inheriting traumatic experiences and so on and so forth. Um, of course, childhood experiences, as Catherine mentioned, of course, they do something to the psyche of the child and then that gets transported. And that's why our families are so dysfunctional in some ways. Um, um, I don't, you know, I was surprised about the week uh, long kindergarten thing as well. It's kind of, um, it reminded me a bit of the kibbutzim thing, but then very different again. Um, and I know that some people used to do that. My mother would have never done that. My mother uh, was born in 1938 and lost a lot of family. And so her first, as soon as she um, mature, was mature enough, um, her first thing was children. And I want to have children. I want to have a family. And of course, the idea behind that, the replacement of the killed, um, Jews, so I'm named after my grandmother who died uh, in the Shoah. Um, and by the way, it's really, it makes me smile to hear you talk about Kathleen uh, Jurek Becker because he was a teenage friend of my mom. And I can say for certain that Jurek, uh, because I talked with my mom many times about it, Jurek was thinking about putting this experience into some form of literature very, very early. So um, he must have been 16, my mom was 14. They would go on long walks and he would tell her about um, Jacob the Liar, his idea. And uh, she would uh, disagree with him, you can't use humor. And they would have really long discussions on that. And she's like, this is wrong, this is wrong, you can't do this. And he's like, that's exactly the reason why you have to do it, and so on and so forth. So um, I don't, you know, I, I don't know if he was increasingly occupied with the Shoha, but it was his main experience. So of course, um, being an artist, he kind of tried to from the very beginning, very early on, to put that into on form of art. Um, what interests me on this, on anna Katrin Handel's movie is specifically anna Katrin, where you're saying, you know, the East German GDR um, perspective, um, telling a story uh, that hasn't been told this way, that hasn't been, that hasn't been told in the past, that he isn't so well found in that way. So, um, I, I do agree, and I'm actually glad you said that, you know, to push in the Jewish topic here would have been too much. I think that's very smart. Um, and maybe that's another movie to look at these like families or different families. Who, like, I mean, the Kahana family is huge. There's a lot of material there. I don't know if they would want to um, do that. And of course, uh, I wanted to point out uh, the works of Daniel Blaufuchs, um, who made that movie on Theresienstadt, and that movie um, that was made in Theresienstadt, about Theresienstadt. Um, and um, I find this work really interesting. So um, talking about who has worked about, you know, the inmates being used. 
So, um, yes, there, there are a lot of parallels. And of course, it's also very different. Thomas Brash was born in 1945. My mom was born in 1938. They're very close in age. But my mom was a survivor and heavily damaged. Um, by what she had to experience and to go through in a very young age. And she lost her mother, a very different setting then. So you have very different um, psychological frame, a very different psychological frame there. Um, and then, you know, when she is 20 years old, she gets, uh, she, she, she becomes a mother, my, my oldest brother. Uh, shows up and then <laughs> and it's the same constellation actually we are like four kids three male I'm the youngest one um so um I didn't read it's interesting too that I didn't read Marion Brash's book on purpose I didn't read it for many years and so because I am kind of I was kind of pushed in this archivist's chronist work um, by the family constellation because my brothers were like, yeah, <laughs> all that Jewish stuff. So I was kind of the candle holder. Okay, so I'm taking the documents. I'm doing these interviews with my mother. I try to um, protect the knowledge. Um, but I, you know, besides my research, um, but I wasn't really like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go out and read my own brush book because it was kind of too close. Of course, because of our meeting here today, our event, I looked into the book and I find it extremely well written. And I find it so humorous. I, um, I really admired her way of looking at her own family's history. I wish I could do that. I don't know if I ever could, you know. Impressive. So, yeah. Thank you. Anna Katrin, I don't know if you want to, to respond to some of the things that Juliette has said. Ich muss zugeben, dass ich wirklich nicht alles immer gut verstehe. Mein I English. have to say, I don't always understand everything. My English isn't that good. The interpreter says she's been trying to write notes in the chat. But I think it's so great, Juliette, that you say what you just said here. I thought that book was incredible. I've known Marion so long. And that's why I was saying with the lightness, it's such an amazing story. And of course, with the other families, it's the same. You know, it's it's similar, but then lots of things are very different as well through the extremely interesting personalities as well. But the way that Marion deals with that as a daughter, it's really unusual and really special. And of course, I'm assuming, and you know, I don't explain it in the film, that there's there's incredible traumatization that has happened there in all phases. But I'm not sort of explaining in the film. I think it's great, Kathy, that you see this, uh, Catherine, that you see this, that this makes you think about things. I think that's all a film can do. You know, if I lie everyone down on the couch then that's the end of a film in the sense of psychoanalysis or whatever. But it's like trying to find connections, trying to create connections. That's what I would wish for. And I think we need to do that a lot more in other forms too. But this novel of Marion's was really the thing that made me go. You know, the lightness, the, the, the humor of her book. You know, with every film, I have a sort of a desire to tell a story. And I say to my video editor, you know, film editor, I want people, when they see this film, I want them to be almost envious that they didn't experience that time. Even if everything ended terrible. I mean, the whole thing's a tragedy from start to finish. But what that means is that you have to make sure that the film has to deal with life and not with death. And that's what I'm trying to do when I make films. And in this film, I'm trying it as well. And of course, you know, your story, as I've already said, Juliet, you know, there were people who came to me and said, I want to, t to have a story about the Hamelin family and about lots of other families. But you can't just 
set out and do such a thing. I think I started in 2011 and 2018, I'd finished the film and I was fast. So it's a great deal of effort. You know, Fassbinder has been dead 40 years now, who is a real master of the post-war West German history. And there was no film about Fassbinder, about this person, about his thoughts, about the way he worked. And, and then I did a film about him for the cinema. And then it isn't a film about Fassbinder, it's a film about German post-war history but it's always sort of pegged on the person. And there's still a great deal more that could be done. Uh, Katie, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. That was totally fascinating, Juliet. So we look forward to the moment when you figure out some way to tell it, <laughs> whatever form that might take. I tell you, I went to a book club meeting of the Leo Beck Institute. They were talking with Helen Epstein. And I was like, you know, I'm like, Helen Epstein is my, like, okay, person to go to. And it's like, what is it? How can I, like, how can I work with this material? You know, I, I'm sitting out of a huge mountain of documents. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. And um, I was already thinking about this while my mother was still alive. She passed away two years ago. And, um, <laughs> I was like, and I told her, I don't know. I don't know how to approach this. This is, is this really difficult? Maybe I need more distance. Maybe I need, you know, so Helen Epstein has some good tricks. So that was, that was good <laughs> to listen to her. I have a question uh, for, for all of you. Uh, I'm just going to throw it at all of you. Um, uh, is, is there a gender, I mean, yes, there always is a gender as aspect. I'm interested in your perception of whether there is a gender aspect and if so, which one to the telling of the, the Brasch family's saga in particular. Maybe I'll start with uh, Anne-Kathrin, uh, weil sie den Film gemacht haben. Uh, war das etwas, was sie beschäftigt hatte? Because you made the film, was the gender aspect something that was important for you? I mean, we see this sort of adoration of the hero Thomas Brasch, maybe I'll just call it that. But it's not just you as a woman who made the film, but there's so many women in the film who tell the story of these men, these men who have since died, the demise of these men, and that's something that emerges from history as well. You know, was that something that you worked with consciously, or did it just sort of emerge? I think you're still muted. Yeah. You know, that's a really important question, an interesting question. Although I don't spend my life dealing with gender things, I'm just a woman, but that's how it is. But I was particularly interested in this case and I wanted to film Marion's novel. I still want to film her novel. I wanted to film it from the perspective of the woman who wrote it, namely from the by the daughter, looking at the mother. And I mean, we, we wrote scripts, right, screenplays. But then there was another film about Thomas Brash, and men made that film. It was supposed to be about the man. And then they had a TV broadcaster, and I knew I wouldn't be as fast as that film. And I wanted to write a, a women's film. For me, the story that Marion wrote is the story of two women. And the film that exists as a screenplay, I still want to shoot that film. Half of the film, the first woman's dead, the mother, and then it's the story of the second woman and the background or the foreground of the men. But what's really happening with the women is the question. And there I would take a different view. That would be a very different aspect. And I wanted to go into a bit more depth about what this does to these women. And that's why Gerda was kind of neglected in the documentary film, because I wanted to tell her story differently all the way up to her death. And then the main story of Marion. I mean, okay, Marion talks in my documentary film about her family. That's what she talks about. She doesn't talk about herself. You know what she's doing at the end you can see that she's doing radio or whatever 
but that was the, what the feature film was going to do. The feature film was supposed to show very different sides. Peter was neglected as well in the documentary film because he was very played a very different role in Marion's life and would have played, therefore, a much bigger role in the feature film. So the documentary film is really just one part. And the other part I couldn't really do because there's the Thomas Brasch film. And in Germany, you know, that's just how it is. My, my film was really a women's film, a purely women's film. And I thought that was important and interesting. So I guess I'm going to have to see if I can actually go and make that film. And that's why the documentary film is structured the way it's structured and why the Jewish history of the mother is a story that is passed on from the grandmother. And the grandmother was also in England, in London. And I would have really liked to have done that film. And I may still do it. We're looking forward to it, if you do. First, Kate, respond. Can't we? Oh. Who goes first here? <laughs> you, go you want me to go first? Sure. OK. Well, I was going to say, but I think this film is a Frauen film as well, actually. Yeah. I mean, there are these incredible, you know, long cameo performances. I was saying in the chat earlier, uh, you know, Bettina Wegner has really yeah. changed with age. She was a kind of fragile read as, I mean, she had a kind of unforgettable, thin, plaintive voice. She has somehow grown into this avuncular, funny, self-possessed. And Katarina Talbach is, of course, a kind of megastar in her own right. She's, I, I saw her act on stage just after they had immigrated. She was astonishing. I mean, she has a huge amount of charisma. And, you know, they are very major presences in this film. And uh, Peter's partner or wife also is very interesting as she makes the elaborate artwork. Um, and I guess I was really struck um, you know, it, and this resonates with what Juliette just said about, you know, the brothers said, oh, no, no, don't talk about that. Oh, who needs to go down that road? But of course, as the girl, as the younger one and as the girl, your implication was you got stuck with all of the heavy pressure. Do something with this. Say something about this. Save save this. Uh, you know, don't let it go to waste. Um, and it seemed in the film as if Marion had a kind of similar burden to carry and her, her daughter. Um, I mean, I guess I'm impressed in the film. Some of these offspring managed to have children successfully. Some <laughs> managed to have children unsuccessfully. Peter wrote for children. That's a huge step forward uh, in familial terms, I think. Yeah, actually, I, I thought, uh, anna Catherine, I thought it was really interesting that, um, you know, that Bettina movie that came out and it kind of, it's like a ping, it corresponds a bit like how and what she says in your film and what she says in that film. I really um, and enjoyed that ping, actually, that was going back and forth just because I had to watch the movie a couple of weeks ago. And I wanted to say, you know, um, Weren't there more women? I mean, there were there were the grandmothers as well, right? Grandmother Potsdam, grandmother, and <laughs> grandmother in London. Yeah. So they, interesting, yeah. Mm. I always thought that you know, um, in my family, um, the I mean, the survival of the family was managed by women. That's the way I look at it. I mean, that's what it comes down to, in effect, because my great grandmother decided that all the kids needed to learn a job so they could actually go out into the world, uh, somehow make a living. Um, that was crucial. She kind of, she tried to save as much of the property and paintings, whatever, um, what was, you know, it didn't didn't make it, but never mind, she tried very hard. Um, and at the same time, she was kind of holding the threats, uh, the connections to everybody and writing letters and being in like in touch even through these times. Um, so she knew where everyone was. She knew where my mother had ended up. And she, it was her who went to Switzerland to pick her up and bring her to East Berlin to meet her father. Um, so, you know, women are crucial in surviving, I think. 
Um, um, coming back, Casey, to your question um, more closely of like gender, you know, um, I think so. I'm not Catherine um, scholar at all. I've, you know, I just watched The Passenger. I found it very interesting. There's much to say about that. I was really impressed, actually. Uh, I didn't have that original reaction that you were describing. I, but, you know, it's much later for me. Um, I, I was really surprised that um, Tony Curtis uh, jumped on this and did that. Um, and then not surprised. Um, it, I, anyway, it's another topic. Very interesting movie. Um, but the gender question in terms of, like, who is speaking? Whose story is told? Uh, and had been told. Um, so while women were kind of, you know, making survival possible, the men were kind of um, performing and in the forefront as, as one of you just said, you know? And it's pretty much the same in my family. And I started to criticize that as a teenager. I was so angry. I was like, you know, what is this here? You know, it's just like all male performance. And um, we, we have to kind of like, what? stay to the side, you know, to stay in the shadow, that kind of thing. Um, and that happened to um, women in these families over and over, you know, they maybe they participated, maybe they supported, maybe they even, you know, written stuff or whatever, helped the men, but the men were the one in the light. And so it's all about telling what story are we telling and telling the stories. But I think the movie that Anna Kathleen uh, made is great because it's already opening a door and i really want to say that other movie i want to see that other movie and a cutscene <laughs> please I, I think we all do um we we have about five minutes uh, left so i'm going to start wrapping this up and um i, I want to go go back to the the topic of of betrayal ich möchte das zu dem uh, so I want to go back to the topic of betrayal here. Anna Katrin, I think it was important to you to make a film in which the issue Stasi wasn't in the forefront, one in which the figures of the intellectuals and the artists in the GDR became interesting. And I think you succeeded wonderfully in doing that, Christoph Heim, Bettina Wegener, Katharina Talbach, Alexander Putzin, they almost jump out of the screen at you. They're so lively, which is really something special, I think. It's not artistic, it's not contrived, it's, it's real. And that's something that is a particular memory of growing up in East Germany, a, a memory of that time that people who were really interested were so real, really interested and wanted to critically engage with issues. But at the same time, from my own experience as well, I think that the issue of Stasi is not something that you can put to one side. Even if you're talking about the percentage of those who were informers to the Stasi, and even if it's not as many as we thought, still there were so many forms in which everyone were invited to get involved in the system of betrayal and oppression of other people. And isn't that something that we have to tell as well? Even if you call it the betrayal trilogy, then it must be that that issue is important to you not to sort of exclude it from the film, but to somehow put it in a context where the people who live there are seen in a more differentiated manner and in which we do justice to their attempt to come up with new ways of living their lives and pursuing that even if they fail or have to leave because it isn't really possible but that it's part of what made these people interesting that they were trying 
to engage with their situation and go their own way. Absolutely. But betrayal doesn't have to be Stasi. And in the film, there's the betrayal of the father when Christoph Heim comes along as God in person. Some people said, does Christoph Heim live that way? I, an East German poet, can he really afford to have an apartment like that that looks at the water like some completely different poet? I mean, it's kind of awful, but that's how it is. He's the only living poet who wasn't completely discredited. That's astounding. <coughs> Betrayal comes up. That story is told that the father ruined everything and then the son took his place. That's sort of classic. That's Shakespeare. That's everything. And that all of the people felt bad the whole time. That's just not how it was. That's not how I experienced it. Naturally, there was Stasi was there. And of course, it was awful, but it didn't make my life. It didn't take my life, take over my life, you know, and Yes, it played an important role in people's lives, but it wasn't everything. It wasn't everything. I mean, you know, there were so many different stories going on there. You know, I sort of looked and looked and looked. There was no proof that the father really did this. So all I can do is tell the story as I know it. But the, there's the assumption there. There's a speculation there. And I think it's important that we understand that and that we talk about this, but I can't basically say that the system of injustice and the awful things that took place there, it's bad enough. We don't have to make it even worse. The film's bad enough, but I think it has moments of being uplifted. And I think this is a film that engages with life. It's very difficult in 90 minutes to squeeze it all in, a huge, huge story of this kind. But my feeling is that it, it has something to do with how I perceived my world then. You go ahead of, and do what you want to do with it. But that's my contribution, including betrayal, but not only betrayal and not betrayal by the Stasi only, but also betrayal by someone who was awful. I mean, I could do wonderful films of the present day about people who betray other people. I mean, I don't know why the building in Chausseestrasse, even though they don't have any binders there anymore, but still, our intelligence service is still there. What are they doing? Who knows? The point is that the secret services files have now been opened for our inspection, and we can look at them now. I did it that way for a reason. Even if you're missing something in the film, but if you're missing something in the film, I miss nothing in the film. No, I don't miss anything in the film either. I don't think there's anything missing. It was just that comment at the beginning. But in the film itself, I don't miss it. I mean, there is a lot of betrayal in there. You know, it's something we experience in every family, betrayal, I think. There's something universal about it, which is why it fits in my trilogy of betrayal. Yeah, I think it really has something universal, but there's also something very special and specific about that time that you are trying to create a more differentiated view. But the other films about betrayal, they are seriously about betrayal though. Well, we look forward to watching them. Maybe we should have a trilogy of your films. Katie and Juliette for your wonderful contributions. Thank you also to the audience. Um, we look forward to seeing the panelists in the, in the green room for a further chat now. Um, and all the best to everyone else. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.